so for um, the message today, I decided to just go with a lectionary and um, the gospel portion that, so, so the theme for today is really about um, wh what truth is for and, and how wisdom plays a role uh, in God's community. And the type of wisdom that God calls for is a different type of wisdom than, than what we're used to, what the world uh, world provides. So <clears throat> just to reflect on um, the gospel portion today, which is taken from Mark 11, 15 through 18. This is the um, story that we're all very familiar with, where Jesus is going to the temple and sees um, ungodly behavior going on in the temple. And so um, in anger, he, he, he does something. So uh, I'll just read this real quick. Uh, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned tables of money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began to look for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the cr whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Um, so... Uh, a couple of things that I want to highlight from this passage, probably something that we've all read many times, and some things that we might not know. Um, right before this passage, there's a, um, a short piece in the scripture of Mark where disciples are approaching actually Jerusalem. They've just entered Jerusalem, and there's a fig tree on the side. Um, Jesus goes to the fig tree, asks for some, uh, looks for some fruit, sees nothing, and curses the tree. Um, and I think it's not a coincidence that this short piece was placed right before this portion in the Gospel of Mark because the symbolism of that fig tree was that if you are not going to bear good fruit then you have no purpose in the kingdom and that, I think that's reflected here as well that there are people going into the temple and doing things that do not show good fruit and in Jesus' wisdom he wants to convey this to these people but now why is it such a big deal why is it such a such a heresy that these people are doing what they're doing in the, in the courts. After all, um, uh, sales happen all the time in church, right? Um, even with our harvest sales. This is something different, though. What's going on, first of all, if you remember, the temple, this is the temp big temple of Jerusalem. The temple had different, uh, different levels, different courts, right? And the outer, so they had four, and the outermost court was open to everybody, right? The Gentiles, Jews, men, women, children, everybody was allowed to go into this outer court. And what had happened was that um, the outer court stopped being an entrance to the temple. It kind of just blended in with the rest of the society, right? People stopped being able to see what the delineation was between the outer court of the temple and the rest of Jerusalem. And that's really what Jesus was 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 cringing at, right? That was, that was the big issue. Um, now, what was going on just during this time, this is a close to Passover. And um, there was a requirement back in the Old Testament. Um, it's actually written out in Levit Leviticus, where um, during this time, uh, every male was supposed to give a Jewish coin, okay, a half shekel. Um, it was kind of like a, almost like a, like a temple kind of um, tithe. You know, it was, it was to you know, promote the, the um, doings of the temple. Now, what had happened was now that people, this was under Roman rule, nobody had these Jewish coins, right? They had Roman coins. That's what they used, you know, in day-to-day -day life. So it would be almost like we, us trying to give a rupee in, in a modern, in, in today's society for, for something in America. So what happened? Now, you have to go to Rome and you have to exchange these coins, right? Um, so, the, so people would travel for, for miles, come to Jerusalem, come with the Roman coins, and then somebody would need to give them a Jewish coin because it was actually the requirement that a Jewish coin was given. So then, of course, you have a situation where people are able to make money. They would have Jewish coins. They would take your own coins, give you a Jewish coin, but also give charge a little bit of interest. Um, this is something, if, if you uh, travel to India, you know this very well. You, you shop around for the best interest rate, or for the best um, exchange rate whenever you're looking for rupees, right? And, and you know that people make money off of this. Now, the issue is that this is people making money off of the Jewish people, especially, uh, it became a real big issue because, remember, Everybody was required, the rich people and the poor people were required to give this coin. So for some people, this was a big amount. And the people that were most affected by this were the poor people. And so people were extorting the poverty. Um, so that was one main issue. 
Uh, another issue was that you were also required to bring um, a sacrifice, whether it was a dove or a sheep um, or another type of animal. And so what people would do is they would just show up to the courts and buy an animal right outside the temple court and go inside and sacrifice it. Um, again, another situation where people can set up for extortion. They would charge you, you know, $2,000 for a sheep when you can buy it for $200 outside of Jerusalem, right? Um, so that was another big issue. Finally, um, this is something that maybe you guys don't notice. Uh, there was a portion where it said, uh, and Jesus did not allow people to travel through the temple with, um, uh, with merchandise. What, what happened was that temple, the temple was actually in a very convenient location right between the sea and between the rest of the city. So people would actually take a shortcut through the temple. Um, and they, would, they wouldn't want to go around. And so these were common people who would just kind of go through the outer courts, traveling and tr taking merchandise from the sea and taking it in. Um, and that was a big issue as well because there's this idea that there's a separation, there's holy ground, especially in that old time. There's a separation between what was for God and what was for everything else. And this line was getting blurred. And then finally, like I mentioned, people would come all the way to Jerusalem. They were required to sacrifice, and there was a meaning behind the sacrifice that goes way back, you know, even to Cain and Abel's time, where um, you would take something that was valued to you, and you would sacrifice it. You would give it to God as an offering and as a testament that the things of that were yours you know came from God, and so you're giving it back to Him. Now the irony is that now you're coming to Jerusalem, and you're buying an animal right outside just to go in and sacrifice it, right? Um, which, if you look at it, that sounds crazy. That, that defeats the entire purpose um, that God had set in the first place for, for this sacrifice. So all these reasons, all these reasons that Jesus in his wisdom saw in the temple and, and, and called them out, right? Um, what's really happening, uh, and especially uh, there were two quotes that Jesus used. The first one was from Isaiah 56, verses 7. Um, and that passage reads, As, And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord, their burnt offerings and sacrifice will be accepted to my altar for my house, will be called a house of prayer for all the nations. This is way back in Isaiah where Jesus had, uh, so God had set aside the temple as a place of prayer, right? That was the original intent of this temple. Now Jesus uh, contrasts this with Jeremiah 7, uh, 7 11. Will you steal and murder? Commit adultery and perjury? Burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known. And, the name and, uh, and then come and stand in my house, which bears my name, and say, We are safe. Safe to do all these detestable things. Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? So you see a contrast between what Jesus had intended for the temple to be and what the, um, the people of that time had made it become. This is the wisdom that Jesus knew and wanted to convey to the people. So what did he do? Um, he threw he threw in the uh, the, over the temple uh, the tables and he drove out the uh, money exchangers right so in his anger this is a righteous burning anger that he felt um, when he saw this difference between what was going on what was intended with the temple and what was actually happening what he saw was that there is a heart behind the customs that was lost right these sacrifices that meant to mean something that idea had lost and instead people had taken the temple and turned it into something else. Now, um, this type of wisdom, Jesus had, right? But Jesus did more with that. He took that wisdom and he applied it, and he had taught people. This is a, many ways that Jesus taught, but this is just one of those ways that he taught through his actions. Now for us, you know, to bring it back to, you know, what we're to do with this. Um, first, we need to know where our wisdom comes from, right? We have a certain type of wisdom that we need to use in Christian life today. Um... I want to take from this uh, verse, 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved is the power of God. Right? So wisdom, even though it's one word, means two completely different things in our world today. Right? Because when you are wise in Christ, you admit that not everything can be explained with your own eyes, with science, or with your own understanding, right? And that is a wisdom that is completely apart from the wisdom of the world, right? Those who are wise in today's world take observations, takes what they know and take what they see, and they put it together and they make inferences, right? 
But there are things that wisdom cannot understand, worldly wisdom cannot explain. Like, for example, the crucifixion of Jesus, right? The resurrection after three days. By no stretch of the imagination does any, even modern medicine today doesn't come close to explaining anything like that, you know? So when you accept wisdom from Christ and wisdom from God, you know that there is a wisdom that you are accepting that's completely different than the wisdom that other people speak about. Now, what wisdom is, it's a difference between knowledge, right? Knowledge with an understanding is wisdom, just like Proverbs 2, 6 says, For the word, the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So knowledge and understanding come together and become wisdom. Um, but like I mentioned, wisdom from the world might be knowledge and understanding. You might have a lot of knowledge about your craft, right? About being an engineer or being a nurse or, um, you know, being a teacher. You might have a lot of knowledge. You might know how to under, uh, understand how to apply that. But the wisdom of God takes it a step further and knowing what the purpose of all of it is for. So when you accept Jesus and become a Christian, um, you know that there's no longer worldly understanding, but then that there's also a purpose, right? Jesus came, Jesus died, and he gave you life. He gave you a new life, right? And all the things that we know, all the things that we do every day have a purpose, and that falls into this purpose that Jesus came for. And now, um, um, now this plays into where I get where we where we get our wisdom from today. You know, our wisdom comes, um, our Christian wisdom, our our um, godly wisdom comes from everything that we incorporate through church and through Sunday school and through um, our parents and uh, and through our community, right? But our earthly education also plays a role. I don't want to divide those two things. I don't want to say that education that we gain through school and through college and through work is a separate type of wisdom, right? That plays a role. But again, when we know that wisdom through Christ has a purpose, that wisdom has a purpose as well. So when we go to school, that education is not just for our edification. It's not just to build ourselves and so that we can be comfortable later in our job, so that we can be comfortable in the income that we have, right? Those are all things that the world gives through school, right? But our purpose is different. And so even our education and the purpose of our education is different. It plays into how we communicate with society, right? So when we are educated and when we go to school for an education or when we gain a career through our education, that helps us communicate with the rest of society. And it allows us to be a light in our society with people who, um, <coughs> who also engage in those things. Um, but it also doesn't give us, um, we cannot be just comfortable in this education. We have to use it. Uh, we have to use it in today's society. So wherever we go, whether that's school or work, um, we use that education and we add something to it. We add an understanding of its purpose. And that makes it so much more. And that separates us from um, those who are, are not educated in Christ. <coughs> now, so I just gave an example um, of how Jesus took his wisdom and applied it. He used wisdom and he applied it through actions. Um, there's another example that was given in the lesson today by Jibin, um, the story of Acts, uh, in Acts 8.26. Um, it's the story of Philip as he's walking and he visits a eunuch. Um, and this eunuch is reading scripture, right? He's just returning from Jerusalem. And so clearly he's wrestling with something that was taught to him. And he's reading this passage and God conveniently places Philip in the eunuch's path. So what, is the, what does he do? The eunuch um, asks Philip for clarification. Um, in particular, the eunuch is reading a passage of Isaiah, and, and the passage of Isaiah is an allusion to Christ. Um, that's very clear to Philip, because Philip had that wisdom. Philip had followed Christ throughout um, his discipleship, right? And so that wisdom was imparted to him. Philip had that wisdom, and he had the opportunity to impart that wisdom into the unit. And so he shared the gospel with him. And he shared it so effectively that the eunuch was moved to be baptized. So that is a particular type of wisdom where instead, uh, not like how Jesus used it in his actions, but that Philip had used it in his words. And I want to compare those two types of wisdom that was being portrayed. Um, both of them... Im through their sharing, God, through Jesus 
um, sharing his wisdom and causing action, and from Philip sharing his wisdom through his words. There was change that happened in society, right? Um, after Jesus overturned the um, tables, um, the temple had changed, right? Uh, he had called out the people and they stopped doing um, the ungodly things that Jesus knew through his wisdom was wrong. And in the same way, Philip shared through his wisdom with the eunuch, and that drove him to baptism. Um, and so just to kind of close off, I want you guys to know that we are called, we are given a certain type of wisdom through the Spirit. And, and through everything that God gives us through church and through our families and through our community, that wisdom needs to be shared. Um, as Matthew 28, 18, and 18 to 20 says, uh, we are called to go out and make disciples of all nations, right? To baptize in the name of the Holy Spirit. And through that, God is with us through the end of the ages. And that is through the Spirit. But this is not a suggestion, right? This is not a recommendation. This is a requirement. God says go. He doesn't say if. He doesn't say when. He says go. And so that is a command to us as well as Christians. This wisdom that we are given has to be shared. And that has to be shared through our actions. And it has to be shared through our words. Um, the importance of this wisdom, it's very clear in these two passages that it causes change in society, right? If we do not share this wisdom, the wisdom of the world will prevail, right? We are battling against a strong voice in society that says, go out and make an understanding of yourself. Go out and make a, make a name for yourself, right? To make yourself great. And to take everything around you and make your own sense of it, right? There's no truth that um, trumps your own understanding, right? You, whatever you decide and whatever you think from what you observe, that is your own truth and that, and, and that can be yours. That is a wisdom that we battle against every day. And when we do not speak out and act out against this wisdom of the world, um, uh, God's wisdom does not prevail, right? And so that is our mission. That is our calling today. And so... Um, as I close off, I just want you guys to think about that. How um, our wisdom, where it comes from, first of all. Does our wisdom come from the world or does it come from a worldly, uh, from a godly understanding? And two, do we use this wisdom? Do we share this wisdom with others? Do we act upon this wisdom? When we see things that are against God in society, when we see things that are not aligned with his will, do we act on it and do we call it out and do we stop it? And at the same time, when others are struggling with a worldly wisdom versus a godly understanding, do we share with them and do we clarify with other people, right? Because when we don't do those things, um, uh, the worldly wisdom um, comes out on top. And that, and that is not what God intended uh, with, with his kingdom here on earth. Um, so I just want to leave you guys with that and leave some thoughts for you guys to, to think about at home. Um, and just to close up, I'm going to have somebody uh, close this up.